Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your watch care over us. We thank you, Lord, for this new week. And as we come to the final presentation of this prophecy school, as all the messages, the thoughts, the encouragements, the admonitions and warnings that you have brought to us through your word, we ask and pray, Lord, that they would all come together and that we might have a clearer understanding of the direction in which you want each of us to go, both individually and as a movement. Ask and pray, Lord, that you would be with Elder Jeff and that you would guide and strengthen him, Lord, in the words that he needs to speak to us. Help us to have attentive ears, Lord, and not to be distracted or lose any of the force of the words that you have given him to speak to us. Be with us according to your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Brother Parminder's information gave me mental overload, so my idea of what I needed to do to bind off my presentations is kind of shot, but I know I know what I need to do, at least cover some points. Um, I took some time to try to show that the passage in Isaiah 28 that is the rest and refreshing, it's not simply identifying the latter rain message, it's identifying the methodology that we're going to have to use if we're going to be successful in terms of securing salvation at the end of the world. And the shaking that has escalated since 2014 um, brought conviction of, uh, to me over the past period of time that I had to go ahead and do the presentation I did last night. Um, I have kind of did that presentation three times before. I did it once in Canada, but I left part of it out. One of the Canadians reminded me of that yesterday. I left the provocative part out. I did it here recently in a small little meeting in Australia, and I did it once in France, in French. Um, but I knew that this would be a little bit more um, significant when it goes out over the I internet. There is no way that my wife and I knew what we were getting into when we got involved with all of this so long ago, and there's no way that we understood the message that we were understanding. It just didn't. I, I could give you reason after reason. My wife and I were speaking about this last night. Um, early on, when the Lord was taking me to South America, my wife had a problem with me going down there because she didn't have the confidence in the men that I was working with. And I just, I loved them. But now that I look back, um, there was a time where Brother Parminder went down to their ministry for a few months, and when he finally came back, he says, you know, they don't ever teach the message you teach. You know, so it was a secondary witness to my wife that the reason they were having me down there is because I had become a famous person in the Latin world in South America, which brought out the crowds, which brought out the money. But as I reminded my wife, I had to have that experience. So it wasn't so much that I was naive, but I had to have some experiences in different places for what I was going to do. Came a point in time where we had recognized and regretted that we did see the role that we were playing in the reform lines, but we never wanted to say it. I would repeatedly lay out the reform lines and I would mark 1996, formalization of the message after I'd identified that as a way mark in several other messages and that's all I'd say, formalization of the message, 1996, Time at the End magazine and I'd move beyond that. And these brethren from, from South America, they set up a meeting where they wanted to expose me as a heretic. I didn't know it. Um, they asked me to come speak as a group of people. And when I got to that point, this is where they were going to blow the whistle on me. And they started saying, but what's it mean that the message was formalized in 1996? Well, it's Time of the End magazine. Well, who wrote the Time of the End magazine? And they started pushing for me to identify what I understood about who formalized the message. And I think my answer was to 
that Latin brother. You need to remember that you printed that in Spanish the same year that I, we printed it in English. And we moved away from it. But it's always been an issue, whether you understand it or not. And it never really was an issue that I pushed, but now we've got people for the last several years that go out of this movement, and whether you get it or not, as they're going out, they use that very logic against me. I can remember the guy that opened up Ezra 7-9, and then I went in and shared it the next day. He got to the point where he was arguing that William Miller didn't accept the third angel, therefore Pippinger's already went off into darkness. My response to him was, hey, Sunday law isn't here. I may go off into darkness, but you're not applying the lines correctly. <laughs> it's always been agitated by the other side. And like I was saying to a sister here, there was years where I used to battle people about, no, you don't call the Adventist church Babylon. I knew that. I, I didn't have to learn that. I knew that early on, but I've always said, you don't call them Babylon because you're giving them a compliment. The most corrupt church in the book of Revelation is Laodicea because it's rejected the greatest light. I always understood that too. But I never thought we'd, I never, <laughs> you know, I never thought there would be a message to separate, even though I know, knew that Sister White says, she has a statement where she says this, we had hoped that there would never be a need for another coming out. Did you know she said that? Okay, so it's, it wasn't a dead possibility in the spirit of prophecy. I knew that, but I didn't think we'd ever reach this point. But it, the idea of organization and the criticism that was coming on, it had to be put in place. So I, wa I want to remind you of a quote here. It's in your notes. And everyone that's been in this message for some time knows this quote. And I don't know where it is at in your quotes, but I know it's in your notes. I don't know where the quote is, though, because I got it on a different piece of paper, but you're going to know it. You're going to know it. So here's what it says. The work, on God, the work of God on the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. Is there anyone that hasn't heard that quote? Pardon me? Page five in your notes. So to keep it simple, I'll just put a few lines. Every great reformation parallels the final reformation. And I'm going to keep it real simple. Pardon me? Oh, a new pen. This is going to be simpler than you have to worry about the pens. They all parallel one another, right? The part minister has been showing us how they aren't as simple as just bring them all down on each other, but they parallel each other, right? And that quote I just read to you is one of the strongest quotes to justify paralleling them, right? Do you know what the next sentence is in the next paragraph? That's not in your notes. It says this, No truth is more clearly taught in the Bible than that God by His Holy Spirit especially directs His servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of salvation. <coughs> Men are instruments in the hand of God employed by Him to accomplish His purposes of grace and mercy. No truth is more clearly taught in those reformatory lines than the waymark that represents the messenger that's chosen for that history. Amen. Each has had his, has his part to act, 
I skipped a sentence. Men are instruments in the hand of God employed by him to accomplish his purposes of grace and mercy. Each has his part to act. To each is granted a measure of light adapted to the necessities of his time and sufficient to enable him to perform the work which God has given him to do. But no man, however honored of heaven, has ever attained to a full understanding of the great plan of redemption or even to a perfect appreciation of the divine purpose in the work for his own time. Men do not fully understand what God would accomplish by the work which he gives them to do. They do not comprehend in all its bearing the message which they utter in his name. There's no way to take that paragraph and not understand that she's talking about the way mark in the reform line that is identifying the messenger. In this history, our history, it's been parallel, paralleled by Noah, who after he did his work, he got drunk. <coughs> Moses, who struck Christ. John the Baptist, who doubted Christ. Elijah, after the victory on Carmel, runs away from a woman. All those stories are there. And they're all pointing to the end of the world. So to identify that way, Mark, correctly, really isn't about human self-exaltation. It's about using the line-upon-line -line methodology to put something in place in the time of a crisis. And part of the crisis now is that in this omega apostasy, which has been typified by the alpha apostasy, which most of us don't understand, was a variety of heresies and rebellion. A.T. Jones, Ballinger, Kellogg, the Mankins, Holy Flesh. Just a couple more. Ballinger. All were there in the alpha time period. W.W. W. Prescott, don't want to forget him. We have that to tell us that in this history, the last history in the Omega, that there's going to be a variety of ways that people are leaving this message, attacking this movement. And what I'm here to tell you is from my experience, virtually every one of those people that leave end up attacking the messenger of this history. Not just attacking him, but suggesting that he's went off into darkness and they are the new Samuel Snow. There's one guy, the Omega guy, Tree of Life. He's not only Samuel Snow, he's Elisha. So at this point in time, when the Lord is saying it's time to put the work of organization into place, then I'm simply going to point you to Millerite history, if you can remember yesterday, that in 1798, there was a gathering prophet raised up named William Miller. And the Lord tried to raise up the spirit of prophecy before 1844. But the two men jumped ship and he had to take the weakest of the weak, Ellen White, and she becomes a gathering prophet and a dispensational prophet. Do you remember the definitions of those? So you got a gathering prophet at the beginning. A gathering prophet at the, end, the beginning and the end. And for good measure, you have a dispensational prophet. Does everyone what, remember what a dispensational prophet is? My brother, I, I shared this some time ago, and a brother that was there when I shared it came up and corrected me then, and he corrected me last night. It's, he points out there's probably two other dispensational prophets. Because when it, if you're identifying a dispensational prophet, the, a prophet that's raised up when the focus of worship has changed from one point, like from the gates of the Garden of Eden to altars, and then to altars to the, to the sanctuary, and from the sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. Perhaps Solomon 
is a dispensational prophet from the tent sanctuary to the permanent sanctuary. Okay, so I don't have problems. I bet you Solomon's name corresponds to his ministry. And what was the other one, my brother? Paul. From the okay, that, that's a thought. Saul, Paul, from the Jewish church to the Christian church. But disregarding those possible corrections, let me use some line upon line beginning and ending reasoning with you. <coughs> those dispensational prophets, and I'm just going to keep them at the level where I've placed them. Noah, Moses, John the Baptist, Ellen White, they're all typifying the anti-type at the end of the world. There will be a dispensational prophet in the final reform movement. That prophet's work will be, deep, be to help direct the focus of worship from one dispensation to another dispensation. There will also be a gathering prophet at the beginning and the end. But there's a dispensational change in here, brothers and sisters. The rebellion that started down here in 2008, 9, 10, and onward, those people weren't involved with this movement back here at 9-11. They have no claim to have been in, in this movement at this time. So when they're attacking the role of the messenger in this history, they're throwing out the reform lines. The warning is, warning is, is guard against the moving the way marks. Not one jot, not one peg, not one pin is to be moved. Yet Sister White says, no truth is more clearly taught than the messenger that is used in these reform movements. And if you're coming in here and saying that the messenger that's raised up here and here either wasn't or has went into darkness and you're still professing to be the experts on line upon line, you've, it's an oxymoron. It just can't work. So I felt impressed that I had to put this in place, not because I want to talk about this, but because Sister White says, meet it. And this is an argument about the methodology and the reform lines in terms of them trying to establish their authority as the, the ones that actually have this message. So I'm sorry that I had to put that in place. But this is why I was sensitive early on to Brother Timothy's presentation. Go there just one more time. I know it's been t touched about three or four times. But I want to remind you, go to Zechariah chapter 4. <clears throat> Let's start in verse 5. No, I mean verse 6. 46 is a good number. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. 
For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. The history here, brothers and sisters, is that when they came out of Babylon and rebuilt uh, the city and the temple, there was one governor that ruled during the time that they laid the foundation and finished the temple, and his name was Zerubbabel, which means offspring of Babylon, which is a symbol of the second angel's message. And during the history of the second decree, the second angel's message, the foundation, the temple is finished, and it was all done under one leader, and Zerubbabel was the governor. So to suggest that the work that began here was not valid because the dispensational messenger in that time period wasn't valid or went into darkness is to deny the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord says that dispensational messenger is still standing when the temple's capstone is placed on. Okay. The only reason I'm going to this detail, brothers and sisters, it isn't anything to do with me. It's about the Omega apostasy, and my understanding is it's been typified by the Alpha apostasy, and the Alpha apostasy in heaven took one-third of the angels. So a great group of people that were following this message are going to be swept away, and they're being swept away by people that claim to be the experts on these reform lines, and they attack the most... How does she say it? No truth is more clearly taught in the Bible, in the Bible, than that God by His Holy Spirit especially directs His servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of salvation. And that's right after the paragraph that we use to identify that every reform line parallels every other. It has to be put in place. I hate to put it in place. I hate to be here at the end of this time period realizing that everyone in the Seventh-day Adventist church is a dead man. That's what I heard was the whole emphasis of Paul's teaching in his time period is that Jerusalem of old is about to be destroyed by Rome. And you better come join Ephesus, which is represented as a white horse that goes forth to conquer and conquer. And it took the gospel to the entire world. I never thought I'd... I just... <laughs> You know, when he started, he had some quotes at the beginning here. I don't know if you remember them. I know he remembers them because I know they were purposeful. But it was, So you can tell me the words. You started with, she says, we're going to have a message that's unbelievable. It's, you've never heard it before. What are those expressions? Strange. <laughs> Page six on thought... Strange new doctrine. I knew when he was saying that. He was up to something. Okay. So what I'm saying is, this argument, all right? My argument, let me take you back. I'm done with the, the stuff that makes me a little bit nervous to talk about. I put it in place. Okay? The, the beginning and the ending of the Millerite history, there was a gathering prophet. There's going to be one at the beginning and the ending. We've already taught this from the reform lines. We've, we've understood initially that the church triumphant is recognized at midnight. Now we're understanding it's really getting developed way before midnight. Okay, so, but from the very beginning, we understood that the church triumphant represented a church that was straight wheat, no wheat and tares mixed. And Sister White's clear, when the church is pure, that every gift is active. So we've known that the spirit of prophecy gets restored when the church triumphant comes into existence. And I'm no way, no way shape, or whatever claiming to have the spirit of prophecy. I don't have dreams and visions. 
The things I've written, I've written for newsletters, not because I was under inspiration like Sister White to get up in the middle of the night and start writing and dump it in, in the basket next to the side of her bed. I don't write like that. So I'm not making any claims like that. But you can't deny, I can't deny, unfortunately, I was used to present a message. It wasn't a message I ever sought out. It was a message just opened up and I had the guts to share it. And the Lord providentially put me in the place to share it. Okay, so I did it. Never liked doing it. Prayed to the Lord to take me out of this work more than once. And I was dead serious in those prayers. Still are. Okay? I'm ready to retire. It's put in place. The history here tells us, if you're going to believe these reform lines, that sure, I would expect at the, in the church triumphant that the spirit of prophecy is going to be restored. Some, at that supernatural level of some type, the, way beyond what I'm talking about in the work that I've did, but there's no way that you can take this line here and teach that it's a perfect fulfillment of this line without recognizing that there was a gathering prophet here and a different gathering prophet here and in this history where there was a dispensational prophet and I'm arguing that every dispensational change is pointing forward to the most important dispensational change in sacred history and it's the judgment of the living. And I tell you what, we were there at 9-11, and we were immediately being led to understand what it was and putting it in the public arena. That's what we were doing. We did those battles, and I know how the Lord opened things up to us. It wasn't even from necessarily personal, personally digging it out. It was brought before us and laid before us. This is this, this is that. So we were there. Now there's people challenging these lines, and what I'm telling you is this methodology here, line upon line, proves that if they're going to fight that truth, if they're going to fight it, then they're repeating the history of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who fought the, the, the role of Moses. Amen. Or they're, they're repeating the history of the Jews that decide, we're not going to eat his flesh and drink his blood, we're not cannibals. All those histories... <laughs> All those histories illustrate that. You, do you think that, by and large, Noah got a lot of support? Okay, so, so that's always the case. We're here again. We're here again, and the proof that these guys are out in darkness, one of the primary proofs is at one hand, they're acknowledging these lines and saying, we're the expert on these lines, but they're denying the way mark in those lines that is more clearly taught in the Bible than any other truth. So what I'm saying is, from the methodology of line upon line, you can demonstrate truth and error. And these guys are in darkness. You follow that logic? And that, that's what I was trying to get to in these presentations, is this methodology in here can be used to demonstrate truth and error. For years. You know, you look it up. I, I, I haven't looked closely, but I know if you look in, in the commentary on William Miller and Martin Luther, that both Martin Luther and William Miller had a special little gift. And it was they looked for and they could spot fanaticism above and beyond the average Joe. And part of my experience was I learned how to do that. I see it. I can... <laughs> I've been, been in meetings like this for almost 20-some years and I don't even have to be on that side of the room to pick up on what's going on that side of the room. Okay, I've, I've seen it. I've, I've bumped heads... Much of what I know about Bible prophecy is because I bumped head with all the false, foolish, prophetic teachings out there in Adventism. Futurism, feast day keepers, lunar day Sabbath, people that are wrong on the daily. That's where I've been. That's the trenches I was in. So I became familiar with all of them. And the most difficult one, brothers and sisters, is the Godhead issue. That's what I call it. And I don't call it mean-spirited. It's, it's the subject. And I'm telling you, it's the most difficult one because it has a connection with us because we, we put a strong emphasis on the pioneers and the people that believe the Godhead definition as the pioneers believed it, they put a strong emphasis on the pioneers too. And if you don't understand that pretty much every pioneer believed 
that it was just the Father and the Son, and though they will not say it this way, that the Son was a created being. They won't say it that way, but I'm not, I'm not being inaccurate to how they understand it. And that the Holy Spirit was simply the spirit of either the Father or the Son. That's a pioneer understanding. Pioneers weren't so afraid to say it. Some of the pioneers would actually you know, pretty much come close to saying that Jesus was a created being. Here at the end of the world, it's not so much. But recently, and since this camp meeting, since this camp meeting, I've got another email. Recently, over the past two or three months, I'm getting emails from people I don't know all over the world that are involved with this movement, and, and they've got my email address, and they, they, they recognize the role I have in this movement, and they're emailing me saying, hey, is the pioneer understanding, I'm paraphrasing what they're after, is the pioneer understanding on the Godhead right, or is it wrong? And that button was getting pushed where, I mean, I had to say something. About the time that we did the anointing for Brother Tabo and Marco and Parminder, I think at the very time, that group of us said, hey, we need to write a response to this. And we kind of divided up the parts we were going to write. And I got started on mine. I doubt that they ever did. But you know where I started? Where I started is a sermon I did about two months ago, and it was this. And the email I got this week, I can bring in here if I had to, to prove this is my point. Because some of these people that I call lovingly the Godhead people, they'll, they would say, ah, I wouldn't say it that way. So they try to get out of the fact that they bring this subject up. But this email I got this week is a perfect reflection of the emails I've been getting. And it goes like this. I've been told that Leroy Froome changed things in the book Evangelism, and therefore you should not ever read the book Evangelism with what he says in there, what Ellen White says about the Godhead, because he's tampered with the book. So when we decided we were going to write something, that's where I started. I said, well, I'm going to go into Evangelism. So in the sermon I did about a month and a half ago, I took that passage in evangelism that the Godhead people are so frustrated with, and you have it in your notes. Page 22. You don't have it how I had the sermon, but what I did in that sermon is I took this passage from page 22. From page 22? No, page 26. You're looking for the notes on the Godhead. I'm looking for the passage on evangelism. Page 26. This is from the book Evangelism. Page 614 to 617. I just got an email this week, as I'm saying, from it's a typical email saying, Brother, I need help. I'm in this message, but there's people saying that we should be following the understanding of the Godhead the way the pioneers did, and they're telling me that I shouldn't read the book Evangelism because Leroy Froome doctored it up. So I went through this portion of Evangelism, and I took paragraph by paragraph, and I went to the original sources, and in that sermon that we did about six weeks ago or whenever it was, I would take one paragraph, a complete thought, and then I would go into the original source and I put it in a box. And there's some people that had that sermon. They were here. If you were in that church when we gave that sermon, say amen. amen. So you all, you all read it. There wasn't one word, not one word that had been changed. Not one. Okay. So there's a decided effort on their part to avoid this passage in evangelism, because Leroy Foon put it together, and this is, of course, one of the places where my brother Dwayne in the back and I often, often have a little bit of a disagreement, because I don't have a great deal of confidence in Leroy Froome at all, and sometimes he'll use him as a historian, and now he's going to tell me that he's got some good historical references. I know that story, but he just bugs me, because he's got his signature on questions on doctrine, and that's when the Adventist church went into total darkness. Okay, so I... That's our little frustration there. But brothers and sisters, everything they deny about the Godhead is upheld here by the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Okay? 
So if you go back to page 22, the one part that I left out of the sermon that I want to put in place is based upon the methodology of line upon line. Because we're in the Omega apostasy. And what typified the Omega apostasy in our history? The Alpha apostasy. It's kind of late in the day, at the end of a long week. I can see you're all fading fast. Uh, you had opportunity. When I got up here, you had opportunity to say, let's call it a night, and you didn't, so you've got to hang with me on this, because I'm going to put this in the record books, all right? This is from Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm not going to read it all. You, you can read it all, but I'm going to take some snippets out of here. And what I'm saying is the Omega apostasy in Adventist history was typified by the Alpha apostasy in Advent history, but it was also typified by the Alpha apostasy in heaven. And it, it, here in Patriarchs and Prophets, as we go through, I want you to see, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because of time, that she's pretty much going to say that before Lucifer began his irritation, that all the angels knew that Jesus was the Son of God, but they really didn't know that he was the Son of God because he was, he was just there working with them, living with them. And even though they knew he was the Son of God, they didn't know the significance of that. But as Lucifer began his rebellion and began to incite problems, it's going to tell us the Father has to bring all the angels together and explain what it means that Jesus is his Son. So in that alpha apostasy, there is a revelation about the Godhead that had not been recognized before the rebellion started. So I'm saying in our history, because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning, once again there's going to be a controversy about the Godhead, and once again there will have to be an acknowledgement that there is a revelation about the Godhead that must be understood here at the end. Okay? So that's what we're starting here is the first alpha. First paragraph on page 22. This is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34 to 38. The law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligence beings demands upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. So she's going to talk about the law of love here in this paragraph. I'm just going to move on. Next paragraph. So long as all the created beings acknowledged the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. They just had to be in unity. Genuine, loving unity. There's not going to be any... You don't have to worry about who... Jesus is at that point in time because you're just all unified doing your whatever you did at that point in time. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. Next paragraph. After she talks about Lucifer's rebellion beginning, she says, little by little Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. The scripture says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now, can you explain why he did that? No, that's the mystery of iniquity. But do you know he sinned there, right? And when he sinned, it was a choice that he made. It was a choice that he made. He didn't have to do that. We don't understand why he sinned, but we do understand he chose to sin. A perfect being choosing to sin. What about Adam? Was Adam a perfect being? Did he choose to sin? Different story. Though, after she quotes Isaiah 14, 13 and 14 in the third paragraph, she says, Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet, covet homage due alone to his creator. Next paragraph. Now the perfect harmony of heaven was broken. Lucifer's disposition, disposition to serve himself instead of his creator aroused a feeling of apprehension when observed by those who considered that the glory of God should be supreme. Really? 
You mean before the door was closed on Lucifer, they began to see the difference between the wheat and the tares? Hmm. In heavenly councils, the angels pleaded with Lucifer. The Son of God presented before him the greatness, the goodness, and justice of the Creator and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his Maker and bring ruin up ruin upon himself, but the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. Lucifer allowed his jealousy of Christ to prevail and became more determined. First problem, image of jealousy. To dispute the supremacy of the Son of God, thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the Creator, had become the purpose of the Prince of Angels. This is an argument over the Godhead. To this object, he was about to bend the energies of that master mind, which next to Christ was first among the hosts of God. But he, would have, he who would have the will of all creatures free left none unguarded to the bewildering sophistry by which rebellion would seek to justify itself. Before the great contest should open, all were to have a clear presentation of his will, whose wisdom and goodness were the spring of all their joy. The king of the universe summoned the heavenly host before him that in their presence he might set forth what? The true position of his son and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. Why would he have to do that if they already knew it? They didn't know it. They knew he was the Son of God, but they didn't understand his position in the Godhead. And there's a rebellion that comes up that's about the Godhead. And God calls all creation together to give them an explanation about the Godhead that heretofore they had not understood. That's the Alpha apostasy. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal self existent one encircled both. Amen. The bold face down there in the end of that paragraph, the Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven and to him as well to, as to God their homage and allegiance were due. The angels joyfully acknowledged the supremacy of Christ. But notice this bottom paragraph. There had been no change in the position or authority of Christ. Lucifer's envy and misrepresentation and his claims to equality with Christ had made necessary a statement of the true position of the Son of God. But this had been the same from the beginning. Okay, this is the revelation about the Godhead that heretofore had not been recognized. Okay, so go to the next page. You can read through that in detail. What I'm saying is that in the Omega apostasy, once again, the Godhead will be an issue because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And God intends that we understand that the right side of the issue is the issue that is making an explanation about the Godhead that heretofore had not been recognized. Is that poor line-upon-line line reasoning? In the covenant with a people, when the Lord brings a people out of Egypt, they're giving an understanding of the Godhead. And what is it? It's right there, Deuteronomy 6.4, in the middle of page 24. It's the pioneer position of ancient Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Why would Moses have to tell those Hebrews that? Don't they know who their father Jacob was and Isaac and Abram? Don't they know the history? Don't they, don't they, or do they? Were they 400 years in Egypt where virtually everything was a god? So when he's saying, here, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, he's dealing with the people that he has to start at the very beginning basic instruction level for them because they've been so long in darkness in Egypt that they don't even keep the Sabbath any longer. 
So what they should have known about God, they didn't know any longer. And Moses is putting in place the pioneer position for ancient Israel. And the pioneer position for ancient Israel was that there was one God, and it was the Father. But when you get to the end of ancient Israel, there's going to be a big percentage of people that will not receive Jesus because he's going to make a claim against the pioneer position. He's going to say, I'm God's son and I'm also God. And it's clear in the Bible and spirit of prophecy that that's what was presented. And there was a whole percentage of people that refused to accept that from Christ because they refused to turn away from the pioneer position of the Godhead. Line upon line tells me that the most perfect symbol for modern Israel is ancient Israel. And there was a pioneer position of the Godhead in ancient Israel that gets further expanded when the Messiah comes and informs the end of ancient Israel that Jesus is also God. Notice this from Desire of Ages 207-208. Jesus claims equal, equal rights with God in doing a work equally sacred and of the same character with that which engaged the Father in heaven. But the Pharisees were still more incensed. He had not only broken the law according to their understanding, but in calling God his own Father, he had, he de had declared himself equal with God. The whole nation of the Jews called God their Father. Therefore, they would not have been so enraged if Christ had represented himself as standing in the same relation to God, but they accused him of blasphemy, showing that they understood him as making this claim in the highest sense. That these adversaries of Christ had no arguments with which to meet the truths he brought home to their consciences. They could only cite their customs and traditions. Now, notice in the middle, but they evaded the points he made concerning the Sabbath and sought to stir up anger against him because he claimed to be equal with God. Next paragraph. Jesus repelled the charge of blasphemy. My authority, he said, for doing the work which you accuse me is that I am the Son of God, one with him in nature, in will, and in purpose. Now, brothers and sisters, we're out of time. It's been a long week, and I've got to finish this up. But i tell you what, what I had intended to do. But a lot of times, I, I don't always do what I'm intended to do. But what I was going to intend to do was this. I was, I was going to have some fun with all of you. you. You can help me on this. We're going to have some fun. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and do this part. When the Lord took us to the 2520, Palmoni stepped into history and began opening up the numbers. And we began, it's like Brother Perminder here. He did a presentation in Holland uh, where he laid out midnight and he pointed out, well, that last general conference session in 1909, he goes through the details, it's midnight. And Sister White was 81 years old. 81 suddenly becomes a number at, for midnight. The Battle of Raphia, there's 81 priests that are going to resist the temple desecration of Uzziah. One of them is a high priest, and 80 of them are just priests. And when you begin to see the 81 you realize it's a symbol of the incarnation. And he started a presentation yesterday, and I don't know yet if he got it. I told him about it, but it was just in passing. He started with Hebrews 8, 1, 81. And it says, this is the sum of the matter. We have a great high priest, okay? Once you start seeing the 81, then you start seeing that it's connecting with us being a symbol of the incarnation. You got the high priest and the other priests. So you know what I know about these, you know what I'm saying about these numbers, right? 
Once we see 9-11, we realize the character, and Adventists know the name represents a character, the character of Islam is in Revelation 9-11. And they had a king over them, whose name in the Greek is Apollyon, and in the Hebrew, Abaddon. Well, that character is death and destruction. That's what it means. 9-11, Islam's character, death and destruction. That's why when Sister White says, the four angels represent an angry horse is seeking to bring, break loose and bring death and destruction in its past. That's Revelation 9-11. But those numbers, they don't get opened up until we understand the 2520. And there was Daniel in Daniel 9-11 marking the oath of Moses. And that oath is the same word that's translated as seven times in Leviticus 26. And, of course, you have Revelation 14, 9, 11. Now, this is where I said I was going to have some fun with you. You guys know any numbers like that? You know, you, 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 the, at October 22nd, 1844, you've got to have a 220, don't you? Because you've got 220 years be, between 677, the beginning of the 12520, and 457, the beginning of the 2300. That 220 years at the beginning of those two time prophecies that come to a conclusion on October 22, 1844, it demands, because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning, that you've got to have a 220 down there on October 22, 1844. And I'm not saying that October 10, 22, 10 times 22 is, is 220, but you can see it. But what I'm saying is, is read Habakkuk 2.20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. So you know those numbers, right? Don't you? You know those numbers? The people that uphold the pioneer position of the Godhead in Adventism are going to teach you that there's a passage in the New Testament that was inserted there and doesn't belong there. We went over that in that sermon, remember? If there is one verse in the King James Bible that has been inserted there by Satan and doesn't belong there, what's it say to the idea that we're seeing things in the numerical arrangement of the King James Version Bible? <laughs> it all comes tumbling down, brothers and sisters, and we can go number after number after number. We're saying that not only was this word inspired, but that God watched over the translation and the formatting of this Bible. And if you don't know that you're saying that in this movement, you need to think it through because that is what's being taught here. Not directly, but we all see it. We all understand it. We're all acknowledging it. Amen. So if you're, if you're of a position as the Godhead people are to where you got to remove a couple verses out of the New Testament that are so directly opposed to your teaching, by removing them, you're destroying your ability to have confidence in that kind of understanding. And on this narrow path where we're going, that's where the Lord's taken us. But they don't just do it with the Bible. They do it with the spirit of prophecy. I can bring you an email just from this week. They're telling me I can't read the book of evangelism. And they're telling him that because in the book of evangelism, all their main tenets are destroyed by a simple reading of the English. There are some of them who say, well, you've got to really, you've got to study these through to explain them. And my response is, no, I don't. If the Lord's going to keep me out of heaven because I simply read and took Sister White's writing at his word, then I won't get into heaven. The, I, the, brothers and sisters, that's part of the, the testimony of the four generations of rebellion and Adventism. That's the third generation. What came into Adventism in the third generation was this hermeneutics, it's higher education, and it comes in two forms. You got to be a historical expert or you got to be an expert on language. And I'm telling you what Sister White says in evangelism here. It's just simple English, and it denies everything they teach about the Godhead. She says that the Holy Spirit is a person, is the third person. He's a real person. In denial of what the pioneers understood, 
She didn't start saying it till 1880, that time period. It's a new revelation on the Godhead. But they will take you, and this is the problem. That's why I started with my experience with heresies. Brothers and sisters, I've dealt with probably all of them as I've traveled the world. And the one, the one that hangs on to this message are some of the Godhead people because of the connection with, with the pioneers. But I've never seen one of them get the priorities straight. Their priority is the message of the Godhead. That message is their prophetic understanding of the Omega apostasy. And the third angel's message has to take the priority. And if it doesn't square with the lines, you've got to set it aside. And I'm telling you, in the Alpha apostasy in heaven, there was a revelation about the Godhead that heretofore had not been understood. And at the end of ancient Israel, there was a revelation about God's Son that heretofore hadn't been understood. And in the Alpha apostasy, which they understand is identifying that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to take the Trinity doctrine of Catholicism unto themselves. And that alpha apostasy, if you read very carefully, Sister White is defining this pantheism of John Harvey Kellogg, and what she's talking about is how he saw the Holy Spirit in everything, right? He saw it in this piano, in this plant, in this board. She says it swept away the whole Hebrew economy. And they take that passage about pantheism, those passages, and they use that to make, it, make a case that this is about the personality of God, because she said so. And they, they make a segue into the idea that this is identifying the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to accept the Trinity doctrine of Catholicism. But I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, the false identification of the Holy Spirit in pantheism wasn't about the Trinity. It was about Satan's efforts to make us misunderstand who the third person of the Godhead was. He's not a spirit from spiritualism. Sister White says, The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. I'm on page 26. I'm on page 26. And the fourth paragraph in that passage says, The Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended to heaven is the Spirit and all the fullness of the Godhead. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. Amen. In the name of these three powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. I'm just one person, brothers and sisters, but... Drop down to the sixth paragraph. Speaking of Jesus, he was equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal self-existent son. He's not a created being. Even if you want to define the creation of him as you do, is he's the only begotten. Oh, he's the only begotten. It means some, somewhere in eternity past he came into existence. Well, if that's the case, Sister White's a false prophet unless you can use your grammatical expertise to rearrange her words. I'm not willing to accept that from the theologians of Adventism. I'm not willing to accept it from people that I'm in this movement with. And, and brothers and sisters, where we're heading, Sister White, this is the work of organizations, the hardest work they ever had to do. And you know what one of the hardest parts of that work will be? Church discipline. I, I, I used to, I never, believe it or not, I've had, I've had pastors invite me to come, a long time ago now, come do meetings at their church, and before I get there, they call me up. 
One Canadian pastor called me up and says, they told me if you get here, I'm going to get fired. Okay, I won't come. I don't care. Um, I mean, I care, but I'm not going to get you fired over it. But I've, I've went, into these, went into churches where the pastors knew this kind of pressure was on them, and they don't even show up. I think, I think he should have been sitting there listening to the message so he could tell his flock, hey, this guy's teaching error. You need to step out of the pulpit. I don't want my flock to hear this. Or at least sit there through the whole presentation, and when I go the next week, explain point by point why it was there. They don't do that. They take it as, well, this is a chance to take a weekend off or whatever. But I never had a problem with that. I figured if I was a pastor and someone was going to come speak at my church, I would want to find out what they were teaching. And if they were teaching error, I wouldn't want them in there. So I got it. I got it. I still get it. But now I get that we're talking about organizing and that it's going to be a hard work. And I'm telling you, this movement don't need the distraction of people that are wrapped up in the pioneer position of the Godhead. Because it means you've got to reject the authority of the spirit of prophecy. And it's wrong. It's wrong. I mean, I, I, they don't like hearing it. But the whole prophetic story is about the development of the persecuting powers that first begin with ancient Israel with paganism. But then in the Christian church, it's paganism and papalism. And at the end of the world, during the time of the church triumphant, it's the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the threefold union that is counterfeiting a threefold union that Lucifer was well aware of when he used to be in heaven. And if you can't see that, then you're on a different prophetic line and we should acknowledge, yeah, we both have some respect for the pioneers, but you need to go another direction. But that, like I said, I'm just one person. But there's, there's enough heresy going on, enough trials ahead, enough work to do, that if you can't see line upon line, that in every major line that would illustrate the Omega apostasy, that the Godhead is an issue, and that it's always about revealing a truth, an unrecognized truth about the Godhead, then you can't realize that Sister White was used in the 1880s to open up the light on the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Godhead, and that means that you've had 140 years to figure it out. That's long enough. We don't need it. Did, did my logic come through? Because I'm pretty tired. Okay, and, and I tell you what, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited. Mean I'm thinking what I heard today, and I knew a lot of that. I'm thinking what Sister White says is right that this crisis is come, going to come as an overwhelming surprise and we do not realize how close we are to the Battle of Raffia. And I know I have family members and friends that aren't ready. I know that we've been given a work to do that isn't getting done. And I'm a little bit distressed about how far behind we are. It's, it's time to clean house and be about the business of putting those final bricks on the temple and getting ready for the crisis is about to hit. And if you're not understanding that, if your priority is, I'm, if your priority, this is the priority, brothers and sisters, I've dealt with the Godhead people. There's many issues with the Godhead people. Their priority is to recognize that the Seventh-day Adventist church through the years is seeking to get to a place where they agree with the the foundational doctrine of Catholicism. And Catholicism will tell you that its foundational doctrine is the Trinity. The prophetic model they're wanting to see is the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is accepting this doctrine. And what we've learned here this week is it ain't about, and I've understood and said this for a long time, brothers, it's a long time. It's not about what's going on in the Seventh-day Adventist Church anymore. It hasn't been for a really long time. You know, you pick up the things about spiritual formation. Okay, that's a waymark. 
That kind of foolishness has been going on since the 50s. I wasn't raised in Adventist, so I don't have this Catholic attitude about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm sorry, I just don't. When I found out the Seventh-day Adventist Church had given a po the Pope a medal, and the medal had the second coming of Christ illustrated on it, and it showed Christ standing upon the earth, and that medal said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Well, I realize they just destroyed their understanding of the Advent and the Seventh-day Sabbath right there on one medal to the man of sin. That was decades ago. I'm not looking for some prophetic fulfillment in the Seventh-day Adventist Church where they accept the Catholic Trinity doctrine. Not that I don't care, but who cares? That's not the issue. It's not even close to the issue. That prophetic model, it's not the prophetic model I'm operating on. And if I were a pastor and I had a church and that kind of foolishness came into my church, I'd figure out how to deal with it. It don't need to be there. It's a distraction. It's going to destroy people because they're going to lose focus on what they're supposed to be focused on. So that's a little bit different end than Brother Parminder, but that is the end. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, it's been a blessed week. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the light that you've shared with us. And now we have the responsibility to break camp. And for me, I always like to remind my brothers and sisters and myself that Sister White clearly teaches that when you're up on that mountaintop and you finally come down, that you need to be guarded. Satan's going to seek to rob the blessing, bring discouragement and troubles, but we need to go back home. We need to internalize and study out what we've heard and not get trapped in a valley. We thank you for bringing us here. Uh, we understand that you're now putting the temple up that is the church triumphant that we are part of and that we have a responsibility to fall in line with a weapon in one hand and a work implement in the other. Help us all to be faithful workers and faithful defenders. We know that there's a, a mega apostasy that is waging, and we know that the things that some of us have said here, that the enemies of truth are going to take little portions of it and put it in a false light and broadcast it all around planet Earth. And we thank you for this because we know nothing done against the truth is ever going to prevail. It's only going to promote the truth. But it is still uh, going to create a shaking. I pray that the brothers and sisters that are here and that are sympathetic, that are watching over the internet, um, that they'll understand that this shaking is a purging that needs to take place. Um, that the Lord can get rid of the tares among the wheat as he's been starting to do since 2014. As for traveling mercies, wherever we may be going, good night's rest. And we ask that you bless the people that were working on these, this meeting behind the scenes so diligently and so hard. In Jesus' name, amen.